Enums are boring and lack functionality. So much that some of the programming languages, like JavaScript, even decided to ditch them completely. And even in the best case, they might provide no more than a bit of type-safe syntactic sugar around integers. Well, if this was your opinion when clicking on this video, I have to disappoint you. Because in idiomatic Rust code, enums are one of the most used features because they are so powerful and safe. In fact, enums are one of the reasons why there is no necessity for a null pointer in Rust and why we can deal with errors so easily and safely. So if you want boring enums, go somewhere else, because we don't do that here. My name is Max, this is Green Tea Coding, let's enumerate and match. Today's task has to do with an imaginary Rust forum that we want to write the backend for. One part of this backend task will be to store a favorite Rust book for every user and then display it on their profile page. So I would suggest let's do this with an enum. So we use the enum keyword followed by a name for our enum, which will be book. And then for now, let's implement two variants that this enum will have or can have. The first is the Rust programming language. This is an excellent book on Rust and it's available for free online, so you should definitely read this. And the other one that comes to mind is Zero to Production by Luca Palmieri, which is a great book on backend development if you want to go that route. So let's stick to those two books for now. You can add the trailing comma of the last option or not. Rust doesn't really care. Um, I think it's good practice to put it there. So this is one half of the task we had. We have to store or find the storage medium of the choice that the user made for this book. The other half will be to display this. And in fact, the backend should do no more than generate a string from what we have already. So we'll have a function, um, we we'll call this display. And we will take in a book by reference of course, non-mutable, and we will return a string for now. This is where I would like to introduce the match keyword. So we write match book, which means we match on all the choices that the book will have. In other languages, this is often called switch in case. So then we open our curly braces, and now we can have all the options that a book can have. So the first would be the Rust programming language. And then we'll put a fat arrow, which is an equal sign and a greater than sign. And now we can put some code that's to be executed. In this case, this is our return statement already. So we just want to put a string here and we'll call this the Rust programming language. And because this is a string literal, we need to create a string from it. We could go to string, right? We could also do to owned here. And we could also do into. Into is maybe the most idiomatic because into will try to convert into whatever is needed at this point. And because the function already knows that we want to return a string, it knows that this string literal has to be converted into a string, which is actually possible, so it will do that. So after each option, if it's only a one-liner, you have to put a comma, not a semicolon, a comma. And we'll have the second option, which is zero to production. And this is going to be called zero to production, of course, into again. So now we can check if our implementation works. Usually you would write formal tests, but for now we're going to be satisfied with just some code that tries out our display function in the main. Now let's see whether this works. We do cargo run. Now, of course, if we would run this into production, it won't take long until one of our users will complain because his or her favorite book is not in our dropdown list. 
In this case, they say, hey, I've read a great book, which is Rust in Action by Tim McNamara, and it's not in your list, and I think you should definitely put it there. Well, a very naive approach, which we're going to follow for educational purposes now, would be to just expand this list, okay? So let's say Rust in Action, we'll put it here, and I will try to compile now. Of course, we forgot this one in the mesh statement, right? And Rust tells us that we can't even compile this example because we did not cover Rust in Action in our match statement here. And this is a great safety feature that Rust has, which is the exhaustiveness of match statements. This means you have to exhaust all the options you have in a match statement. This is not the case for languages like C and C++, where you could easily forget to add this option, and good luck finding all the switch case statements that switch on this book enum. So in this case, Rust has us covered. So we'll just say Rust in action is going to translate to Rust in action. And what you can see now, of course, is that this Rust in action variant is actually never used. So for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to suppress these warnings now. So we'll allow some dead code here which is not best practice for your production code, but for this tutorial, it's going to do. And again, we can run, and now we're going to compile, and we can change this to Rust in action, and we're going to have Rust in action. Now, of course, you would be losing a lot of sleep because of this solution. How many Rust books are there, and how often does a new book appear on the market? So this is definitely not our permanent solution for this problem. In fact, I would say that we shouldn't even care about what books are on the market. We just put a few here, but we don't need to know all of them. So why not in the front end present our user to have the option other and then have some text input where they can just put any title they like. So we'll have the option other here. Problem is now, how do we store the text input that the user has? Well, we could, of course, have an additional variable and then always ask with if the choice is other, then we'll have to go back to this variable. But this doesn't seem like a real nice solution. Instead, Rust has us covered again here. We can add data to an enum variant. So, for example, the string here will mean our other option will always contain a string. And if we match on this other option, we can then store the string as a variable that we will use for now. And we know that this is going to be the title. And we'll just return the title. You see that Rust is not really happy with us here. The compiler says, hey, you cannot return a string reference, which we see we have here, as a string, which is an owned string. So again, we have to do the into here, and everything is going to be fine. So this little tweak opens up the whole world of Rust books for us, because now the user can choose the title by himself. And in fact, if I say your favorite Rust book is other, and it might be something like atomics and locks. And again, we have to do the into here. Let's see. And this will work just fine. Your favorite book is Atomics and Locks. And this is why I said in Rust enums are not boring at all. Actually, they are very powerful. We see that we can store different data in the variants. These variants all have no data. This variant does have a string. And we could also say that if somebody has read so many books that he doesn't even want to name a title, he just wants to say how many books they read, we can have another option, amount, which maybe stores an unsigned 8 integer, and this will just allow them to say how many books they read. Of course, we would have to cover this in the match statement. We don't need to do it now. This is just to show you that we can have different kinds of data behind any enum. Going back to our task, well, we have finished kind of successfully, and we pushed this in production, but again, it doesn't take long until we get feedback to our display function. The users tell us, well, it would be so nice to also see the author of the book. 
So in order to make that happen, we will split our display function into a function that returns a title and one that returns the author. But what do we do for other? What if we just return no author? Okay, so we could do something like this. And we will just return an empty string. And in this case, we know that we don't even need the title. So instead, we'll put an underscore here. This underscore will tell Rust, yes, there will be some variable stored in other, but we don't need it. Or we could put unknown author here. But all of those solutions don't really seem very idiomatic. And also they seem prone to errors because in both cases we are returning a string. And how should we know whether this string is actually an author or whether this is just some default string that we agreed upon that we will return when there is no author. Instead, I propose to use option here. And this is gonna be an option on a string. And this means that this function can either return a string or nothing at all. So whenever you want to use some part of the core language of, of Rust and you need some more information about it, you can just go into the official documentation. What we can see here is that option is a type that is stored in the standard option crate. And we can see its definition here. And lo and behold, it is an enum. And this is why I said in the beginning that enums are one of the reasons why there is no necessity for a null point in Rust. What you see here is that option is templated on type T if you were in C++ lingo, or you could say it's a generic of type T. We haven't covered generics in this tutorial series until now, but just think of it like this option can hold any type and this any type that is not known to us yet, will be called t. And we have two variants in this option enum. The first variant is a none, which means it doesn't contain any data. And the second is sum. And we will see here that sum contains one instance of a t, whatever a t is going to be. Of course, now we cannot return a string directly, but we have to wrap it in the sum variant of option. And in our case of the other, we can now return none. And this seems to me like a very clean solution that everybody will be able to understand. Now let's take another look at our display function. Of course, we will have to update this as well. I suppose we could do it in the following way. We say the title is going to be title of book. And this will always succeed. And then we will match on author of the book. Of course, what we match on now are the two variants that we have in our option, which means we have sum and the contents of sum will be the author. And if that is the case, we can format something like the following. Format, by the way, works in the same way that print line works. We have placeholders here. This is going to be our title written by, this is going to be our author. So we put the title and author here. And for our second option, we have none. None doesn't contain any data. And therefore, we can just return the title because we don't know who the author is. Now let's check again if everything runs. And you see, this is a nice way to handle the case where we don't know about the author. My favorite book is Rust in Action, written by Tim McNamara. So we have the author here. And your favorite book is Atomics and Locks. Well, of course, I can't let you leave without showing you some slides, can I? Let's talk about the enum memory layout. Every enum has a 64-bit discriminator. This is just a way to distinguish between all of the different variants that your enum will have. And this is what I was talking about when I said in the beginning that in a lot of languages, enums are just syntactic sugar around an integer. Because this is exactly it. This is your integer, your 64-bit discriminator that discriminates between all of the enums. So if we only had those first three options, 
each of the options would take 64 bit in memory. So you can think of it as mapping to 0, 1, and 2. However, what about the other option that stores a string? Well, additionally to the 64 bit discriminator that is always needed, we now need to store the stack part of a string, which requires 3 times 64 bit for pointer, length, and capacity. However, what this means will be that every other enum as well will now have to be a size of 256 bits. This makes it so that every variant has the same size. Well, why is this important? Because the size has to be known at compile time if we want to put this thing on the stack and if we want to make arrays out of it, for example. So even though in most modern systems, memory is not really a big concern, if you are in an environment that is memory constrained, for example, in the embedded world, please take note that if you store a lot of data in one of the variants and the other variants have no data or little data, they will still bloat your memory usage by a lot. As it is so typical for Rust, the compiler is again your best friend. We saw that match statements have to be exhaustive, otherwise they won't even compile. And this gives us the safety that whenever we add a new variant to our Nenum, the match statements have to be updated as well and we cannot forget about this. Beyond that, the main power of enums lies in the fact that they can store data and even different data in different variants. And this lends itself very well to modeling some real life problems that would otherwise be a pretty big mess to deal with. So if you learned something new in this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. I'll see you next time with more Rust Fundamentals.